Well, I was born in Jerusalem two years before the first Arab-Israeli war in 1948. And that war was catastrophic for all Palestinians, and especially to my family, because uh, during that war, my father, who was a civilian, was shot and killed by an Israeli sniper, leaving my mother with seven children. Not only this, but uh, after we buried him in the backyard of the house, we have to flee. We were forced to get out of the home, my mother and seven children, and get from our neighborhood in West Jerusalem to the old city, Jerusalem, and look for relatives to uh, take us to their homes. It, it was a terrible situation. I was only two years old. Another, uh, my sister, the youngest one, Diana, her name, she was six months old. But you can imagine the tragedy of us uh, leaving our homes for good because we were never allowed to go back to it. And then we, we have to uh, move out by force from West Jerusalem, where we lived, to East Jerusalem, uh, where other family members were there. As a matter of fact, 300,000 Palestinians also were moving from West Jerusalem to East Jerusalem in 1948, and from other villages around uh, Jerusalem uh, to flee the Israeli uh, occupation of uh, uh, West Jerusalem. Well, how would you describe your childhood in the West Bank? What was it like? Well, uh, you know, being um, uh, without a father because my father was killed and being in orphanage schools, boarding schools, um, with about a hundred other kids, you know, it is not easy life. It's not like a normal life where you live with both parents in your own house, you know, and you have your own bedroom and so on. Uh, so it was very challenging. It was a, a rough childhood, but thank God, you know, we survived. And here I am now, 77 years old, but by God's grace, uh, I survived until today. But I would, when I reflected my childhood, it was really tough. You also published Through the Eyes of Our Victims, the story of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Why, who was the target audience for that book and why did you feel it was important to write that book? Uh, we had, you know, um, we, we lived in Bethlehem. I was teaching at Bethlehem Bible College. We have tour groups coming uh, and uh, quite often they didn't know there are, there are such thing as Palestinian Christians. So, and they would ask us many questions and I would give lectures and try to explain to them, but quite often they would ask, do you have anything written? Do you have anything written? And so I decided, why not write something simple? You know, so my first book, Through the Eyes of the Victims, is like the ABC of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Anyone that does not understand the conflict, they can read that book. It's a very small book, about 100 pages, and they can uh, learn our perspective on the Arab-Israeli conflict. But then the other book, you know, Palestinian Memories, focuses more on the family, especially on my mother, and then an update on what is happening with the Arab-Israeli conflict. So in your book you write, what the Palestinians want more than anything else is the recognition that they were wronged. Can you expand on that quote? Yeah, we were wronged in 1948 when nearly 800,000 Palestinians were ethnically cleansed. They were pushed out of their homes by the invading Israeli army, and they became refugees in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, also in the West Bank. Today there are many, many refugee camps that go back all the way to 1948. And it seemed like when, when uh, we became refugees, you know, we took the keys of our homes with us, hoping that within a few weeks we can come back. The Israelis secured the borders where any Palestinian man, woman, or child that tr tried to cross back and come back to his or her home 
was shot and killed right there on the spot. So the bulk of the refugees stayed in refugee camps, and these refugee camps continue to exist until today. So we, we definitely were wrong, but that is in 1948, and it continued until today. We never had one day of peace. In the West Bank, our land is being confiscated. Our water resources are confiscated. Our freedom is denied. So yeah, we have been wrong uh, tremendously. And that's partly because of US policy and because American bias towards Israel, whether it is for political reasons or theological reasons, they are biased against the Palestinians. Have things turned around and we were the Jewish and we are becoming refugees, the United States would have stood with us 100%. Is the debate that's going on right now between the plight of the Palestinians and the, um, the anti-Semitism that's also going on, how do you respond to those two things being conflated? Well, first of all, anti-Semitism is wrong. To hate Jews because they are Jews is absolutely wrong. Or to hate Christians because they are Christians is wrong. Or to hate Muslims, Islamophobia is wrong. Any hate of any people is wrong, including anti-Semitism. But to point out to the wrong things that the Israelis are doing, that's not anti-Semitism. That is reality. If Jews go to the West Bank, confiscate Palestinian land, destroy Palestinian homes, incarcerate the Palestinians, and we talk about it, that's not anti-Semitism. Because we talk about it without hate for the Jewish people. We are only hating what they are doing, not them personally. I don't have hate for Jews as Jews or Israelis as Israelis, but I don't like what they are doing to my people. And that makes a lot of difference. So your perspective is that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, despite the yes. debate. Yes. yes, the Zionists had an agenda even before 1948. Uh, the, and the, uh, the Zionist agenda is to take over Palestine and make it a Jewish state. Well, you know, that doesn't sound good for the Palestinians because the Zionist uh, leaders like Theodor Herzl, when he was asked what to do about the Palestinians who live there, he said, we need to push them out to the neighboring countries and take their homes and take their fields and take their places. So this is the Zionist agenda. We are against that agenda. We are not against the Jewish people per se, because in Palestine, Jews, Christians, and Muslims live together in peace for many, many generations because Zionists start coming from Europe to take over Palestine. So following the atrocities that happened on October 7th in Israel, there's been a lot of conversation about why Hamas chose to act that way. Is it insensitive to ask why following those atrocities? Well, I'm glad you asked this question. I was hoping you would ask it because a lot of media here in the United States, they, they just keep pro broadcasting as if uh, October 7th is the start of this conflict. October 7th is not the start. It's a continuation of a conflict that has been going since 1948. Also, the Gaza Strip have been under siege for 16 years under blockade for 16 years. Imagine Portland, you know, being under siege for 16 years and the people in Portland cannot do anything. They cannot have bread or water or uh, fuel for their cars. They cannot even move from place to place without the permission of the people who are putting them under siege. What would the people in Portland do? Of course, they are going to resist. In our case, when we as Palestinians resist, they call us terrorists. 
you know, but we are resisting an occupation. The terrorists are the people who are occupying us, not us. But, you know, a, a lot of people say, oh, this was unprovoked attack on Israelis. I would say, no, it is provoked by 56 years of occupation and uh, 75 years of taking over Palestine and making the Palestinians refugees and 16 years of the siege of Gaza. That is what caused uh, Hamas to do that. Now, do I agree with Hamas? Of course not. Do I agree with their tactics? Of course not. Do I agree with the uh, Islamic agenda of Hamas? Of course not. Um, but what I, I agree with is that people under occupation have the right to resist. Regardless whether they are Hamas or, or call them whatever. I mean, in Ukraine, they are resisting the Russians and we are supporting the Ukrainians because they are resisting occupation. You know, I, I wish the United States will understand that we are people who want freedom like any other people in the world. And, and that the United States will put its weight to end this conflict, give us our piece of land and give the Israelis their piece of land and reconcile us together. But the United States policy have been following the dictates of the state of Israel. And that's why it failed in the last 75 years. So do you still believe that a two-state solution is possible? Because I know some Palestinians uh, want a one-state solution. Well, for a long time, I was an advocate of the two-state solution, and I would be going from place to place preaching the two-state solution. But it's not us Palestinians, it's the Israelis who ruined the concept of the two-state solution by uh, building confiscating Palestinian land and building Jewish settlements all over the West Bank, where now it's becoming impossible to have a two-state solution, not because of our desire as Palestinians, but this is the, the, the work of, the, of different Israeli governments. Uh, so if, there's, if the one-state solution is not going to work, because Netanyahu said, there will never be a Palestinian state on my watch. Well, if you don't want two states, and of course Netanyahu would not want one state, so how can we solve the problem if you reject the two-state solution and the one-state solution? Well, his idea is keep those Palestinians in ghettos, keep them under our thumb, keep them under our occupation and oppression, and that is his only solution. He thought, you know, they can keep Gaza 16 years in blockade, in a siege, throw away the key, and everything will be fine and dandy. It doesn't work that way the people under occupation will resist. So then you mentioned that you spent time in Gaza. Why is there so much dissension over the phrase, Gaza is an open air prison? Well, um, I, I uh, wouldn't agree it's an open phrase prison. I will say it's an open uh, space concentration camp right now because in prison you have rights. In prison you have food. In prison you have water. In prison you have doctors to take care of you as a prisoner. In Gaza you don't have all of this. So I wouldn't call it a prison, I'll call it a concentration camp. Is that the fault of Israel or is that the fault of Hamas like some people are claiming? I think it's the fault of both, but I give more fault to the occupier because 75% of the population of Gaza are refugees. At one time, they have their houses, their homes, their land in what we call today Israel. And in 1948, in 1967, they were pushed out and they ran to the Gaza Strip and they wanted to go back to their homes and Israel would not hear of it. And that's why we have the conflict in Gaza. So Israel created the conflict, but Israel is not willing to solve it. And that's why we keep the uh, cycles of violence again and again and again. You also wrote in your book, 
The Palestinian struggle against Israel in all its forms is a direct result of the occupation of their land and the suffering of their people under that occupation. What's your response? I agree with myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, if we have no occupation, there will be no resistance. If there is no occupation, there will be no violence. If there is no occupation, there will not be five wars in Gaza. And if we have no occupation, there will not be all the settlements in the West Bank and the humiliation of millions of people in the West Bank and Gaza. The occupation really is the fountain of all of these um, grievances, violence, destruction, and bloodshed. Take out the occupation, then try the Palestinians. In my opinion, they are very peaceful people, very loving people, if you take off the yoke of occupation. So how are you dealing with this personally while you're living here in Eugene, you know, thousands of miles away from Gaza? How are you handling this? Well, first of all, my heart is heavy, like every Palestinian around the world, every uh, Arab around the world, every Christian Arab, every Muslim Arab. We, we are all heavy about what is happening, happening to the people of uh, uh, Palestine. The way I deal with it is through my faith. You know, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus Christ, and he is the Prince of Peace. I, I know God ultimately is in control, although I don't understand what's happening today, but I know ultimately God will bring peace and justice to my uh, land one day. So uh, I deal, first of all, with myself, and I constantly go to God and repent of any hate, of any bitterness, of any feeling of uh, lack of forgiveness, even towards the people who killed my father, made us orphans, took our home, uh, destroy our country, and, uh, and now killing about 7,000 people in Gaza. Most of them are women and children. I say in my prayer, Lord have mercy on them. Lord forgive them for what they are doing. So my, my faith in Christ really helped me to live another day. Well, Christians in their history overwhelmingly supported wrong causes. In, uh, I used to be a, a professor or teacher of uh, church history. We supported pogroms against the Jews. We supported the uh, Inquisition. Christians created the Inquisition, not Muslims. We um, created the uh, Crusades. It's made by Christians, and, and we were wrong, wrong, wrong uh, with that. We were wrong about slavery. Christians, you know, uh, were wrong about slavery. We, we enslaved people in the name of Christ, in the name of bringing them the gospel and so on. Christians have been wrong in the past. Christians are wrong today when it comes to Palestine and they need to repent of their cruelty towards the Palestinian people. How do you feel about the pro-Palestinian protests and how they might be conflated with anti-Semitism that's also rising in the United States? Well, uh, I, I would not want this uh, conflation between anti-Semitism and uh, really a cry for the liberty of the Palestinian people. They are totally two different things. But I wouldn't go to a demonstration where it will be anti-Semitic. I am totally against anti-Semitism. I don't want to see any Jewish blood spilled, whether in uh, Palestine, in Gaza, in uh, Europe, or in the United States. I don't want any synagogue to be hurt or damaged or bombed or anything. I think all blood is sacred, whether it is Jewish blood, whether Palestinian, Christian, Muslim blood, all blood is sacred and therefore I would be against uh, anti-Semitism. But I am glad there is a world consciousness 
about this occupation and a world understanding that humanity is understanding that unless you solve this problem, we are going to have cycles of violence again and again and again. So I appreciate when people go out to the street and saying free Palestine, as long as they don't say destroy Israel, because our goal is not to destroy Israel. My goal is to see Palestinians and Israelis to live together in peace and justice um, on one land, either as neighbors or in a, a one state solution. So how does this end for you? I think sooner or later, the world conscious is going to rise up against oppression, just like it rose up against the occupation of India by the colonization of India, just like it rose up against um, the apartheid state in South Africa, just uh, uh, it rose up against uh, the, uh, civil, uh, the civil right uh, oppression here in the United States and the civil right mov movement and Martin Luther King and so on. I think the world conscious is going to rise up in support of righteousness in the Holy Land, peace in the Holy Land, siding with the truth, not siding with Israel against the Palestinians or Palestinians against Israelis, but siding with justice, with truth, and with equity. That's what we are asking for. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. That was wonderful. I hope they don't fire you.